Great. We'll get started then. Um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is March 28th, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. Um, just a few quick updates before we get started today. Uh, update on our free qualification. Um, as of this morning, we had 395 people that have um, submitted applications for pre-qualification. Um, they're at all license types. There's a good distribution, um, including testing facilities, all three tiers of product manufacturers, and uh, a good number of those, I would say probably about half are cultivators. Um, so that's great, um, really, really exciting. Um, we're going to begin the process of issuing approvals next Monday. So at our board meeting, we the board will be kind of reviewing applications or recommendations from our staff around approvals and issuing approvals. And um, we'll be posting just the kind of basic metadata on the pre-qualification applications on our website so that people can get a sense of how much of each license type um, has been pre-qualified. Um, just a reminder, though, that pre-qualification is voluntary. It is not required. Um, and, you know, it's really kind of up to each individual uh, prospective licensee as to whether or not that process makes sense for them. Um, and again, if there's any questions about pre-qualification, please, um, you know, first try and look at our guidance on it. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, you know, we've been updating it updating it as questions come through. So that's ccb.vermont.gov slash prequalify. Um, and then if you can't find your answer there, you can always email the board at ccb.info at vermont.gov. That's ccb.info at vermont.gov. And then we also do, um, uh, Nellie can field questions and try and get back to people uh, on the phone. That's 802-828. 1010 and then option zero is for the adult use program. Um, update on our uh, licensing window for operating licenses, um, which opens this Friday, April 1st. Um, you know, this initial licensing window is for small cultivators, testing facilities, and integrated licenses. Um, we need to begin to issue these on May 1st. Uh, which we will do, and um, the we've been kind of beta testing the online portal. It, it's a different portal than our pre-qualification. Um, all indication is that it's ready to go on um, April 1st, and so if you're looking to seek a license and you're a small cultivator, testing facility, or integrated license, um, you know, that opportunity will open on April 1st, this Friday, and uh, I know the law says that we have the authority to close this window. Um, I would say at this point, the board has no um, intention of closing it. Um, if we do, if that changes, um, we do have a provision that requires us to give 30 days notice. Uh, so we will, of course, comply with that. But um, I don't think we have any intention of closing this window for small cultivators, testing facilities, or integrated licenses. Um, a few notes on this, uh, you know, the, the fingerprinting authority is still pending at the FBI, um, which means that, uh, you know, we submitted our authorization about a year ago, um, almost a year ago uh, to the date, I think 11 months and some change, um, still have not received that. Um, so our fingerprinting requirement is going to look a little bit different um, for this initial licensing window. Um, it'll be very obvious uh, in the application process how we're going to handle criminal history checks, um, but it is probably not going to be fingerprint based. So just um, when you're applying, just um, wait, you know, kind of follow the application process and be prompted. You'll be prompted for kind of the criminal history records, um, probably a little bit differently than you might have been expecting, but, um, but it'll be easy enough to follow. And then um, with respect to payment as well, um, it's sounding to me like our online payment might also be decoupled from the application process specifically. 
Um, we, of course, will be accepting things like money orders and checks. We would prefer people not paying cash, their, their kind of application fees. But, um, you know, I think we will have an online payment system up and running um, soon. It's not clear whether we're going to have that on April 1st, though. So just stay tuned on the payment piece, um, and we will have options available for everyone seeking a license. Other than that, um, you know, we we do know that the next licensing window that opens is on June 1st for all other cultivator licenses. Um, the board hasn't made a final decision, but it's looking like we're going to open um, tiers one through five of the indoor, outdoor, and mixed tier cultivation licenses. So not open that largest license tier for indoor and outdoor. Um, so those those tiers you can see both in our fee bill and um, in our rules. So um, just keep an eye on uh, that final decision from the board about which cultivation tiers we intend to open. But it's it's sounding like we're going to do one one through five. Other than that, um, just need to approve the minutes from our last meeting on March 21st. Julie and Kyle, have you had a chance to review those? Yep. Yep. All right. Well, I take a motion to approve the minutes from 321. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So today um, we're going to do some more guidance. Um, some guidance documents. I have just some very basic slides up on um, both kind of our insurance requirements. And then I just wanted to do a quick note on kind of economic empowerment as well. So only four slides today on this. <laughs> Probably good for everyone. Um, OK, so our insurance requirements are in rule 2.2.2. .2. And I will pull them up here. So I think we all remember that um, originally, we had thought about setting a specific uh, minimum amount of insurance uh, and general liability insurance specifically. Um, in this rule, uh, we had kind of that a, a cannabis establishment shall obtain at a minimum um, general liability insurance of no less than a million dollars per occurrence or two million dollars in the aggregate. Um, you know, we heard uh, a little bit or quite a bit of, I say, I should say, public comment that, you know, given the, the status of cannabis um, federally and the kind of status of insurance uh, around the nation, that that might be difficult for some people. So we did change the insurance requirement um, to what is in sub A. Uh, just that a cannabis establishment shall maintain commercially re commercially reasonable levels of insurance, um, which really kind of shifts the onus to the licensee to kind of determine what's right for their business. Um, and, you know, also recognizing that there still might be a hardship in obtaining insurance, um, that there we have an alternative, which is laid out in sub B, um, which is essentially a self-insurance. You set aside a sum of money um, based on your license type, and that money can cover, um, you know, these issues that arise that typically insurance would cover. So um, we've been getting quite a few questions about what is commercially reasonable mean. Um, and, and I recognize that, um, you know, it's, it's not clear from this what is commercially reasonable, um, but really this is one of those areas where it's tough for the board to provide specific guidance. Um, there are just too many permutations 
um, as to the various cannabis businesses and who your customers are and where you're located, um, for us to kind of just say a baseline amount of insurance. Um, I can say that for the most part, all small businesses usually maintain a million dollars per occurrence and $2 million in aggregate. Um, that's a very basic policy for almost all small businesses. Um, but we really did in, in this section, in this rule, push that decision to the individual licensees. Um, I've done some research on cannabis insurance, um, and I've talked to a few, a handful of um, businesses, both in-state and nationally, that insure cannabis businesses. And um, I guess I'll just, uh, you know, some some basic points that, that I'll make based on that is, um, yes, all insurance, everyone I spoke to in the insurance industry said that for any small business, including home-based sole proprietors, a million dollars per occurrence and two million in the aggregate is the amount of insurance that they recommend. Um, that That is a very basic plan. Um, you know, there are a number of options in this field. Um, don't feel like uh, there are no insurers out there because there are. They're mostly surplus line insurers, um, meaning that their coverage is limited um, and there's a lot of exclusions and it's more expensive. Um, and, you know, a lot of and that is mostly due to the fact of the federal status of cannabis. Um, you know, these insurance companies don't want to put their businesses at risk by insuring um, companies where there's federal illegality. And also there's a lack of historical data that usually informs people's risk calculus. Um, so um, but there are options out there. Um, You know, the board really does feel that general liability insurance is an important um, aspect of doing business, and it's common in every industry. There's a number of other state regulators that require not just insurance, but specific amounts of insurance for cannabis businesses. I um, mean, really does help protect the business owner, but also everyone that's setting foot onto that operation. Um, we have, we do you know, we have tried to recognize the hardship that people might face in this in this area. You know, we've offered the flexibility of um, not setting specific baseline amounts of insurance. We've, um, we have the kind of escrow alternative, but I just wanna mention one other point here, which is that we do have a general um, waiver provision in our rules and I'll pull it up here. So in rule 2.16, the board maintains the authority to waive any of these regulations so long as such a waiver, one, is necessary to achieve the purpose of Vermont law, and two, does not create danger to the public health, safety, or welfare. So essentially, um, I think we all are familiar that we are required to prioritize small cultivators. And I think we can all recognize that um, you know, someone who is a small cultivator, small cultivator might be in a position to not afford a high policy or high premiums that a cannabis policy might might carry with it, and that their risk is relatively low. You know, if you are growing at your home or in an existing farm and you don't have other employees and you're kind of not a fire safety or something else to, to any of your neighbors that, that, you know, you might not need, um, you know, $10,000 or a full insurance policy to cover uh, potential risk. So I think that, you know, there is a possibility that the board might want to use the rule 2.16 waiver provision on a case by cases, case by case basis with respect to insurance for specific types of businesses. I don't think that this should be the rule, this should be the exception, but I do feel like um, if we're giving guidance to people and our guidance is really determine your risk um, as, as your business, talk to insurance companies, um, tell us, uh, or try to get insurance, but if you absolutely cannot and you can't 
set aside the escrow amount. And I think the board might use this. And here are the kind of basic questions that I think the board would use to guide our decision as to whether or not to grant one of these waivers. Um, and essentially just um, why are the insurance requirements unachievable? You know, I think I would want to see at a bare minimum that you've tried to comply um, with 2.2.2. Um, but for some reason, you know, the premium is too much and the escrow account, you know, it would make your business unprofitable. Um, second, what type of business do you have? Is this a, you know, tier two product manufacturer or is it a tier one small cultivator? Um, how big is your business? You know, what, how many how many employees do you have? Who are your customers? Are people coming on to your property uh, regularly? Um, you know, that's really what general liability insurance is, is made to protect against is, you know, at a bare minimum, the cannabis board regulators are going to come on to your property or inspectors, um, you know, folks from the agency of agriculture, you know, if there's an accident, um, you know, that's what this insurance is designed to, to protect against. <laughs> Where is your business located? Again, if you're, um, you know, co co-located with other businesses or other, you know, there could be some real risk there to your neighbors. Um, but if you're kind of out, you know, relatively, you know, isolated, then, then maybe, you know, your risk is lower. Are you a sole proprietor or, um, you know, are you the only person in your company? Is this, is the risk really to you only or is it to someone else? So I don't know, Julie and Kyle, I don't know how you feel about all this, um, but I thought this kind of, you know, just to help answer some of the questions we've been getting about, about insurance, whether this is a viable path forward. Um, can you go back to your list of questions? Yep. Um, in the first one, you know, why are the, the um, requirements unachievable? Do we anticipate that would it, people would really um, tell demonstrate that they have tried to get insurance? I would. I for me, I would want to see yeah. that. Yeah. I just want to make sure people understand the risk. You know that if they don't get insurance, that they're that they're they're taking on a personal risk. Right. Yeah. Agreed. So we, yeah. Sorry, Pepper. No, I was just going to say that we could add that in, but go ahead, Kyle. No, agreed. I mean, a, a lot of what we are are designing is is to help folks protect themselves from the worst case scenario. Um, and so, you know, I totally agree. I think this needs to be the exception, not the rule. So when we look, you know, through these considerations, I I think it would be prop. I would want to see, you know, some type of correspondence that you've put your best foot forward and and tried to you know, meet the requirements of 2.2.2 before we, you know, fall back on on making waivers um, without seeing that a, an applicant has really, you know, done everything in their power to, to kind of meet those requirements. Yeah. So what, why don't I add that, uh, like maybe as a subheading or um, just, you know, who, like, who have you spoken to about insurance, which, you know, just maybe help kind of define what unachievable actually means. Is there anything else that we should add to this list, do you think? Anything that you you all want to consider when when thinking about a waiver that might be helpful for the public to know? No, I think these are good. I think you pretty much covered it. And you know, some of my conversations, I know, you know, folks will need potentially to come up with a lump sum in year one, at least for insurance, right? And that's present in other types of, you know, insurance that everybody needs, whether it's through your mortgage or your business or what have you. So again, you know, to me, that wouldn't necessarily be the the deciding factor. Um, it can be a factor, but, but I think for me, I'd want to see, you know, how much effort did you put in to this requirement before we grant a waiver? Yeah. And this is just for general liability. This is not for workers comp or any other type of insurance that someone might be required to get when they open a business in Vermont, right? That, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm hesitant to name specific insurance companies because I don't want to feel like we're pushing people in one direction or endorsing one um, company over another. But I will say that the, the current medical dispensaries in the state have insurance 
and they have insurance through Vermont chartered insurance brokers. So there are options in this state um, and there's uh, options nationally as well. Are there captives? There are no captives in this industry, at least not that I know of. Um, but the self-insurance is right. just shy of a captive. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, I think this, I think we can kind of use this as our, our guidance document on, on the insurance um, and we can see how it goes and whether we need to kind of adjust as applications start coming in. So, all right, let's see what we got. Um, I think I also wanted to just talk a little bit about um, economic empowerment um, because I know that our fee bill was signed on Friday and it did grant people the, or it did grant the board to um, waive fees for um, social equity applicants. And social equity applicant, it did not say anything about fee waivers for what we're calling economic empowerment applicants. So I thought it might be good to just kind of talk about this a little bit. Um, so, um, In general, um, just to take a, a step back, you know, the board was given a direct um, kind of directive to develop criteria for social equity applicants and waive fees for those um, applicants. And we were given pretty strict parameters as to what the legislature intended as a social equity applicant. Um, the, you know, the law, Section 11 of Act 62, says that the it's um, individuals from communities that have historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition or individuals that have been directly and personally impacted by cannabis prohibition. Um, so the you know I think the board and our social equity subcommittee you know went back and forth about who which communities um, I think that the second half of that is relatively easy. You know, people who have been directly or pers personally impacted by cannabis prohibition. What we came up with that is if you have a incarcerated for a cannabis related offense or a family mem member that's been incarcerated for a cannabis related offense, then you have been directly and personally impacted. It's really the first part um, that becomes challenging. And I, th I know we talked about disproportionate impact zones um, that other other states have used um, to define kind of communities that have been impacted. Um, the, the analysis didn't work so well in Vermont. It was, I think, both over-inclusive and under-inclusive in that it, it included a lot of people um, that probably, I mean, essentially all of Chittenden County is a disproportionate impact zone, whereas nothing in Essex County is. So how is that kind of equitable or fair to um, anyone. Um, so we decided to really kind of look at historically um, the kind of data that's been collected. And I think there is very compelling data on the disproportionate impact, both through kind of selective policing and um, disproportionate incarceration rates. Um, there's, there's very kind of compelling data to support that Black Americans and Latino Americans have suffered as a result of cannabis prohibition and there's there's kind of you know the, the data to back it up and that's not to say that um other there haven't been similar impacts with other demographic groups or communities um we certainly see a lot of discrimination against people because of the color of their skin their ancestry their sexual identity um, their socioeconomic status. Um, but when it comes to kind of this question about which communities have been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition, you know, we, we have to have a rock solid kind of data set to point to, to show, to defend our decision there. And so, you know, when it comes to kind of some of the other demographic categories that we considered, um, I just don't feel like it, the program would have would have survived um, if we had if we had been inclusive of all the people that have been either underrepresented in society or discriminated against um, for this 
specific program. So that being said, um, I think that our decision on fee waivers uh, is now enshrined in law, and we can we can waive fees for um, you know my black or Latino owned businesses or anyone who can show that same sort of disproportionate impact um, of um, being part of a community that has been selectively policed or um, has been targeted for increased incarceration. Um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to kind of women owned businesses, other minority owned businesses, LGBTQIA businesses, owned businesses, I think we needed to kind of come up with a separate set of privileges. Um, and so I just wanted to review quickly what we did um, as far as expediting and prioritizing um, non-social equity, but economic empowerment um, applicants, because they, they will, under our guidance, um, be given priority. The priority will be not to the level of social equity, but it will be our second tier priority. So I just I thought it'd be helpful for us now that H701 is now lodged just to review this quickly. This is the same document; it hasn't changed from the last time. Um, but essentially, um, the order of review for applications we will start with priority, then we will move to expedited, and then finally general applications. And so the priority. Um, this is again our social equity applicants. Um, expedited are for minority owned businesses, um, which is essentially all the um, groups that we removed in our final rule from social equity. This is um, first generation Americans, immigrants, LGBTQ, people with disabilities, women owned businesses, veteran businesses. of people kind of of a lower socioeconomic status. And, um, you know, they will receive expedited priority um, in our review process. And then um, just one other piece, you know, our positive impact criteria also acknowledges that kind of economic empowerment is an important um, aspect to the entire industry. Obviously, you know, a lot of the kind of economic empowerment communities or demographic groups are underrepresented, not just in society, but also severely underrepresented in the cannabis businesses. Um, and so, you know, I think part, let's see, part C really speaks to, um, trying to improve opportunities for economic empowerment um, businesses um, throughout the industry. So um, all of the kind of Part C criteria, I think all of it applies to not just social equity owned businesses, but also women owned businesses, minority owned businesses. Um, so I think uh, it's important just to remember as well that, you know, there are some other advantages to being um, to applying as an economic empowerment um, applicant. And um, I think, Bryn, if you could maybe correct me if I'm wrong, there's all, we also have a plan for doing some um, technical assistance for economic empowerment applicants as well. Yes, um, that is in the works. So if you submit your application and um, you are identified as an applicant that would fit into the criteria for economic empowerment, um, then we will be connecting uh, those folks with technical assistance. Um, that's a program that's still in the works. We're putting it together, but it will be available um, some point soon. So any questions, Julie or Kyle, about that? I just thought it'd be nice just on the kind of eve of opening our initial licensing window to kind of review um, some of this. Can you go back up to the expedited? I just want to, I just want to look at it for a second. 
The only thing I find confusing is that here we refer to expedited applications, but in 903 it talks about priority. So just if anyone, it might be confusing in general for people. Um, because the 903 makes it look like, well, it talks about priority, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and it includes other things. So I just don't want people to be confused when they're yeah. reading through this. We can tweak some of this language if you want. I mean, we could call this economic empowerment application. Or yeah, we that might help, but yeah. just to make sure that it reads differently to people. Yeah, I understand. Otherwise, I think she, yeah, Julie's point. Uh, I just want to say, generally speaking, I think in the flurry of of information and, and requirements that we have, this DEI or expedited program might, you know, not be getting the attention um, that it, that it might deserve. And and I'm I'm thankful that you brought it up um, today, Pepper, because I just want folks to remember that that this is something that we intend to do. Yeah, um, yeah. I just, I, I think it's important, it, just like you said, to to remind folks that if you are a woman-owned business, veteran-owned business, that that there there is a benefit to identifying um, that in your application process. Great. All right. Um, let me see what else is on our agenda for today. I think we're a little ahead of schedule. Is there anything, any other issues that we need to discuss? I think, I think there's something that you should do, which is to take a vote on the decision to open up uh, applications up to tier five cultivators. So we meet that 30 day requirement. Um, we have to announce 30 days prior to the opening, which will be May 1. So you technically have until Friday, but since we're here, <laughs> you've talked about it, you've made a decision. Would you like to take a vote on it? Is there a motion? Um, I move to open uh, <coughs> one through five for, cult for cultivators, indoor, for outdoor, and mix. Does yes, that isn't that the goal? Yes. Yes. I, I I figured if there was a motion in a second, then we could have a discussion about it. Yes. So second. yes, for all for yes. Okay. Now, do we want to have a discussion about that decision? I know we talked about it kind of informally at the beginning of the meeting. Um, do we have sort of data that um, supports that from our, our pre-application? We do. I just got an email about this. Um, so yes, so from our pre-qualification, um, I guess I don't have the mixed tier in front of me. I do have it split between indoor and outdoor. And so the vast majority of the cultivators um, are tier one and tier two. Um, there are, um, with respect to kind of tier five, um, we have three total um, tier five pre-qualification -qual pre applicants. So they're not a, not a lot. Um, tier four, there's three total. Um, so the vast majority are tier one and tier two, the pre-qualification applications. So I think that um, our kind of decision to kind of start small and go slow will be upheld if we go tier one through five. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the pre-qual data looks like pretty great with respect to the smaller tiers and our ability to really do what we intended to do when we started this process. You know, um, I think we've always kind of held the tier six in our in our pocket, hoping that we might not need to start with it, um, depending on how a couple things go. And I think we're at that point where um, we can make that decision, but also recognizing that, you know, tiers three through five, they're going to help provide our, our program with some stability. So there is, um, you know, good reason to go with those licenses right now. Great. Well, um, I guess we should vote then. Um, and just to clarify, it's for all, for indoor, outdoor, and mixed. And mixed here. Okay. Um, all right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Great. All right. Good decision, I think. Um, anything else, Bryn, that we didn't, didn't do? All right. Then why don't we shift to public comment then? We're a little ahead of schedule, but um, that's all right. Um, if we, if you have a public comment um, and you join via the video link, please raise your virtual hand. Um, and when we get through those comments, we'll um, shift to folks on the phone. Okay, uh, first up we have Glenn. Yeah, hi. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so this is Glenn Anderson calling. Um, I do have a question pertaining to the process. Um, sorry, I'm a little out of breath. I just ran to a place where you can hear me. Um, so the uh, system that you mentioned, the portal, you know, we are working with a number of licensees to uh, essentially you know, create a fluid system so that they could put their data in and then uh, we can push that into hopefully an API uh, that you guys have for the portal. And I was wondering if that's a possibility, if that's up yet, uh, and if that will be something in the future that we can integrate with uh, for not just uh, licensing, but also for uh, continuous um, compliance management. And ideally we do, I was talking with Mike over at Agency of Agriculture, um, and we're talking about doing similar things for the hemp program with them. Uh, but I would like to also integrate with the tax department. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately that's where we're going to see a lot of um, failures in compliance. So, you know, I really respect the work you guys are doing uh, with respect to making sure, you know, small tier, uh, tier one, two, three are all just getting into this mix um, because that's critical. I think the healthy uh, economy is going to be based on how many producers and professionals are out there delivering uh, quality goods. So, you know, respect to you guys for doing that. Um, I, I do hope we can connect on the, the application front uh, so that we can get an API that will effectively um, be one of these things where, um, you know, we can make that fluid so that, you know, they don't have to require huge attorney's fees to uh, be in compliance all the time. And it's not a defensive game, but rather uh, just a steady business function of a system that's that's pushing that data forward uh, to you, but also to the tax department, um, reconciling with banks as well. So that's one piece. Uh, the other piece is in this uh, licensing process, you know, for the hearings going forward. You know, I haven't heard anything yet uh, with respect to... Uh, if people should have opposition to licenses that are before you. And particularly in my case, uh, you know, our system's called the Cannabis Collective. And we've been doing this for quite some time now, coding it. And there's other people out there trying to brand jack us. So for us, you know, it's really frustrating because, you know, you get to the part where two weeks ago, there's a federal uh, ruling on copyright law. And, you know, we don't have those protections. So, I'm literally uh, forced with a decision of do I take these attorneys representing this other client to the professional responsibility board um, because there's no other checks and balances uh, for us to protect this brand identity, which you know is a, is a significant concern. If we brought it before the USPTO, uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, you know, and they would look like it. They would you know look at it and say, well, if it looks like a duck acts like a duck, it's a duck. And the crossover is pretty significant. So without getting into that case here, you know, there are matters that aren't necessarily trivial as far as some, you know, neighborhood PTO group opposing a, a retail license that's maybe 1,500 feet instead of 500 feet from, uh, you know, a school. So, you know, I think having that definition uh, so that we can all know what to expect and how to participate in the process uh, not just defensively, but, you know, uh, essentially on the offense to make sure that the fences are up around our properties uh, for our brands. I'll give you a case and then I'll finish really quick. Um, my, my group, the Dihedra group, we've done judicial evaluations for the state or we had previously for a decade and a half. Um, all sorts of pro bono work for the Vermont Defender General's office for an employee feedback system that we built for them. You know, those things, you know, ultimately, I think were parts of um, 
you know, what I did is the dihedral group, but that brand was under attack uh, back in 2014, but we had it secured with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office because it had nothing to do with cannabis. And so we had those federal protections. So, you know, in the lack of uh, federal protections uh, for brands, I just hope that you guys can maybe establish some sort of process, some sort of checks and balances so that we can work these things out uh, before they become major issues. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Next, we have Benjamin. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks again uh, for all the good work you're doing. Um, I would like to second uh, what Glenn just said about branding and trademark protection, um, something that I'm kind of, and I'm sure a lot of people are starting to move into. And um, I also am, you know, I'd like to see some guidance and maybe some um, action on uh, that front. Um, other comment that sounds like we're already working towards it, um, you know, potentially getting these, starting to accept applications on May 1st, if I understood that. Um, and I just like to advocate for that and say, let's get these uh, going as soon as we can so we can, um, you know, we don't have to wait until June 1st to start seeds and, you know, be planting, you know, almost in July uh, for outdoors. Well, thank you. Thanks, Benjamin. Anyone else uh, who joined by the link? Jared. Yes, hi. I would just like to suggest that you offer expedited consideration to applicants trying to open a business in an opportunity zone. Is that okay. something you would consider? Um, we will consider it. Yeah. Um, thanks. Anyone, anyone else? Uh, Thomas. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me now? Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Uh, this is Thomas Popke from Opia Farm Genetics and the Herb Collection. How are you guys today? Fine. Thanks. Uh, so I have no questions at all. I just want to, on behalf of uh, pretty much everybody in this industry, uh, we've had so many meetings just getting together and how we're doing all of this. And we all agree you guys are just such amazing people and we can't thank you enough for everything you're doing. It's a lot for all of us to just go through and be like, okay, how do I turn my simple idea into a real legitimate thing? And for you folks to work so hard, we just can't thank you enough. Thanks, Thomas. And so that's it. Just have a great week and we look forward to, uh, you know, opening of licensing on Friday. Great. Uh, Tree Frog Farms is next. Hi guys, I just wanted to say thanks for all the great work you've been doing. Um, just a clarification on what you guys did just vote and approve. So as far as I understand it, April 1st, licensing opens for all three tier one uh, cultivators. That's mixed, indoor and outdoor. What you guys just did was bump up the approval for two through fives up to accepting on May 1st instead of being licensed then as the small cultivators are. and. Uh, my second comment and concern is what do we have for guidance in terms of your seed to sale and, and tracking? Because I know I'm a small tier one mixed light cultivator. That's what I'm going for. But I, I really don't know. Can I purchase seeds at this point that I won't be able to start until May 1st? Um, come May 1st, if I get my licensing, will I be able to take clones off of personal plants that I've already started? Um, I know that obviously this first year we're getting a late start, but I, I'd really like to see some focus um, in terms of that. So as a cultivator, I can start going one route or the other way, or, or at least have some good idea of what I'm going to be doing come May 1st. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Matt. Hey, good morning. Uh, 
one, I want to say thanks for all your efforts. Uh, as always, I appreciate the time and the effort and taking public comment from us. Uh, my concern is not a lot of the substance of what was spoken about today, but I am concerned about the legislative actions uh, that are holding up the medical bill. Uh, and I cannot stress this enough that we have three multi-state operators in our <clears throat> vicinity of this state, uh, two of which that are within the country, one that operates outside of this country. And I cannot believe that our legislature, and I don't know if there's anything that can be done at this point, they are not taking up the medical bill. And we know beyond belief through pictures and verification throughout the years that those folks have never cared about our patients. And I'm really hoping there might be an avenue that we can expedite and do something to make sure that those people, and I'm sure most of them believe that what they are getting is clean and tested. It's not. They test themselves and they spray pesticides and that is in Senate testimony. So I am sick and tired of the legislature, which has screwed this entire industry in the first place, not doing anything to protect our patients. And I don't know if there's anything at this point that you folks could suggest or we can do as a community to make sure that our patients are taken care of, because I hate seeing them have to submit to high prices and poor quality. And again, I appreciate all your time and effort in all of this. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Michael. Uh, hi, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for all of your work and especially the social equity portion. It means a lot to me and um, I'm very glad that it's within the process. So thank you so much and have a nice day. Thanks, Michael. Anyone else who joined via the link, please raise your virtual hand. I'll also open it up to folks that join via the phone and you can hit star six to unmute yourself if you'd like to make a public comment. All right, um, I'll close the public comment window. Um, I, I did want to just clarify um, just because you know we did take a vote that was um, not on our agenda so I feel like we should just be very clear about what we voted on um, so April 1st this Friday the licensing window opens for all tier one cultivators um, that's outdoor indoor and mixed tier um, it also opens for testing facilities and integrated um, licenses but uh, all tier one cultivators um, can apply on April 1st. And, um, you know, we will begin issuing licenses, operating licenses um, for those um, tier one cultivators on May 1st. What the board just um, voted on uh, was to open the remaining tiers of cultivators, tiers two through five, so not tier six, but two through five on open that licensing window on may 1st to begin issuing licenses for tiers two through five on june 1st and the the tier one cultivation window will remain open we have no intention of closing it um so you know you don't have to do it on april 1st um but just you know there's a question about that the board had kind of posed whether we need to open tier six immediately. And the decision we made was no, we're not gonna open it immediately. Um, we're gonna see how much um, cultivation, kind of rough canopy we can achieve or the, the market can achieve using only tiers one through five. Um, and so we need to kind of give the industry 30 days notice before we open a window. So if we decide we need to open tier six, we will vote on that and let the, you know, through the course of our open meetings, um, let everyone know um, if we intend to open tier six. But the, the decision we made just now is to only open tiers two through five on May 1st. Anything else? Um, I should say that we are having our just typical public comment meeting tomorrow evening. Um, you know, we don't 
answer questions. This is really an opportunity for members of the public to give the board advice, to kind of give us your thoughts, your comments, um, to help shape our thinking about kind of the future of the market or the current market. And, um, you know, if you have questions for the board, feel free to give us a call, feel free to kind of check our website for information or email the board. Um, we do try to kind of collect people's questions and answer them um, through our FAQ documents, through our guidance. Um, so you can always ask us questions, but um, just to be clear, when, when you ask the board questions and we give you an answer, we are in a very kind of ethical gray zone because we can't answer specific questions about your specific business in any sort of binding way um, in these meetings. So um, please, you know, just recognize the limitations that the board is operating under um, at these public comment sessions. And um, but we are having one tomorrow evening. The link to join that meeting um, is up on our website or will be. And um, I don't I don't have anything else. Any, Julie, Kyle. No. Just very quickly, you know, we, we got a couple really nice messages, thank yous uh, at, in the public comment session, and I want to I want to just acknowledge and, and pass along that thanks to our staff. We've got a very lean staff um, that does an incredible amount of work. Um, they've been racing around the clock to try and get the licensing portal ready for Friday, um, and so I just want to make sure everybody listening, you know, extends that that thank you um, to everybody who's who's really working hard to try and uh, meet our timelines. So. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that, Kyle. I should have. And, you know, even getting our rules done, you know, I think we literally set a record for the fastest turnaround <laughs> in rulemaking uh, in Vermont's history, <laughs> certainly for kind of the scope and breadth of the rules. Um, and so just a huge thank you to all of our staff for, for making this possible. Yeah. We're, we know that there's a lot of questions out there. Nelly's on the front lines of that. So be patient. We'll we'll get back to everybody um, if you have a question. So all right. Well, um, that's the end of our agenda. So I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all. Um, and we'll see you again tomorrow. See you.